Hey, MJ, uh, thank you for coming in. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a marvelous background. You're like a cyber anthropologist. Yeah, there's <laughs> all mean, kinds of stuff going on. <laughs> I, I think this is the first time uh, I, I've interviewed somebody with that kind of a background, but you're doing all of this uh, work across so many different communities and you bring so much experience and really transformational digital reshaping to the global marketplace. So I really appreciate you coming in and doing this interview. Yeah, definitely. All right. You know, my audience is very varied. In fact, it's it's very sort of CXO centric. In fact, every time I do a post, I get a lot of founders and CEOs and things like that, and board members um, actually uh, looking at what I do. But I also have scientists and notable experts as well, because that's just the nature of the communities uh, that I interview in. Uh, and where my interviews appear, but there's always this curiosity, you know, you, you've got this marvelous background, you're doing really wonderful work globally. So what created this amazing MJ? I mean, what, what are the three <laughs> inflection points, the two inflections points in your life that resulted in, in who you are today? And, and maybe it was when you were three or five, or maybe it was older, but there's got to be something that triggered this. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think there's there's so many different pieces. Um, I was an only kid growing up, and so I always was really fascinated by this idea of technology and, and how it worked. And then I started watching Star Trek and, you know, <laughs> got all that. And I was a voracious reader, so I just I um, would just read tons and tons of uh, novels and a lot of sci-fi. And, and I think that, you know, there was this moment, um, I think at some point, you know, my parents had said to me something like, well, what are you going to do to be of service to the world? Like, not just what are you going to do to make money, but like, you know, what are you going to do that will help people? And all of my parents have a role that is in some way of service to others, right? I was raised by a doctor and an anti, you know, terrorism and disaster preparedness expert and a nuclear engineer who worked at a power plant. So they all had these like very direct connections to the work that they did in tangible benefit. And I, you know, was really fascinated by cars and stuff like that. And I wasn't really sure like what I wanted to do with all of it, but that stuck with me. And so when I got to college, um, originally I was gonna be a high school English teacher, you know, and really go down that route because I had a very impactful one, but I ended up finding this field of cyborg anthropology. And I just knew that this was the thing that I wanted to check out and study um and to get into and i didn't know what it was going to turn into as a career but i knew i'd use it for something so that's probably where that came from is the, the push from the parents so i'm really curious i mean i i can see all of this confluence of the influences within your family then you know because it's very interdisciplinary and uh, multidisciplinary and that's shaping uh, where you are in this aspect of giving back or having some kind of impact uh, for the for the good of the world, for the benefit of Earth's ecosystems or humanity, right? It's sort of the combination. Yeah. So, so explain cyborg and anthropologist and the and the confluence the of those two together. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I often say the funny way of describing cyborg anthropology is it's the fastest way to give your parents a panic attack when you tell them that's what you're studying at university. And I also say, uh, you know, definitely, I spent money studying Star Trek. That's a real thing. I did that. But really, more tangibly, what cyborg anthropology does is look at not just how we make technologies, but how they remake or reshape us. And this is really relevant right now. The term cyborg refers to a cybernetic organism. It's the merging of organic or human and inorganic um, or technological. And that actually can be not even with just humans. It can be, you know, um, you, an augmented dog. I don't know, you know, but the idea is that we don't get to just pick up a tool when it's convenient to us in modern society. There is no unplugging completely in the current context of the world. And so um, resisting that causes us a lot of suffering. Choosing it and getting curious about it gives us a lot of opportunity to make wiser decisions about what technology we bring into our own personal lives, what we bring into our workplaces, and what we bring into culture at large. So that's what that's really about for me. Well, that's, uh, you know, really fascinating. I, do, do you um, study a lot of, you know, because digital transformation or digital fluency and all of those aspects are part of what you do, you know, this whole aspect of digital opportunities. So does this involve like uh, AI machine learning and, you know, big ideas like quantum computing and yeah. some of some of the oh, bio, biomedical innovation and so on as well? Absolutely. So, 
you know, cyborg anthropology was founded um, by uh, several anthropologists, but especially Dr. Donna Haraway, and it was originally coming from primatology and then went into studying medical science and the anthropology of medicine and the human body. So it can feel very um, different than traditional tech studies that are just about digital tech. It's messier, right? Um, so it, it actually is particularly well suited to biomedical discussions, um, augmented brains, that sort of thing, where we have to confront the biological and the technological at the same time. But in my day-to-day -day work, you know, really how cyborg anthropology shows up is understanding how companies and organizations change when you introduce new technologies or remove them. And so I've really found that this framing of digital fluency is the right place to look. There's a lot of talk about digital transformation or going digital, and a lot of times those approaches start with just one thing, like we're gonna introduce a new tool, we're gonna to introduce AI at the company, but then it doesn't really go anywhere. So what we've realized is that digital fluency is more than just knowing the buzzwords or having a few tools. It's, it's this idea of understanding several pillars of digital fluency. Um, I tend to sort them into thinking, skills, data, business models, and tools. Because if you don't have all of those in place, you're not really able to achieve digital transformation in any meaningful way. We kind of look at how do you raise the lowest common denominator so that an organization can consistently and scalably engage in digital and whatever that means for their context. So do you find then that the work you're doing right now, uh, you know, with, with your current uh, company, uh, it very much related to the work that you did with NTNT Innovation Institute, where you were, I believe, the cyborg anthropologist and resident. So, is, yeah. is the work similar? It is, yeah. So, I've actually had Causit, our company um, that has a, a couple of us on the team. We've had that since 2006, and so NTT Group contracted with us. And I, I think that you know what was interesting about that was in the context of NTT. There was a lot of people coming through who were in senior leadership positions, like IT leaders, CTOs, CXOs of, of various flavors, um, CISOs around the security space, for example. And groups like NTT and their partners had a lot of cool technologies available, and even some professional services and things like that. But what was missing, I think, sometimes for people when they came into, say, a briefing center or on a Silicon Valley tour was the context. Okay, yeah, we see some cool startups and what they're doing. We see some, you know, cool fundamental technologies and R&D that large groups are doing. How do we actually apply this in our company? So there were two pieces of that. Uh, the cyborg anthropologist in residence piece was explaining what it would be like to be a cyborg or, you know, connect our brains to the cloud, as it were. Um, and it was this future pool of looking 5, 10, 50 years even out into the future to see what the, the use cases and the tensions and ethical issues would be and that that created context for why it was important to invest in digital fluency, digital technologies of various uh, flavors, and upgrading the fundamentals of an organization today. So the, the fluency piece is the now, and the, you know, the cyborg anthropology piece is really more of the future pool, the, where it's going. You know, it's kind of fascinating then. I mean, I can see, uh, you know, NT&T is what, one of the world's largest uh, telecom companies. So, and, you know, they have an I innovation institute and then you're leading these conversations that involve things like the ethics of our AI, the internet of things and the social network of things, uh, big and little data, nanotechnology, robotics, uh, financial yeah. services, governments, healthcare, education, mobility. That almost sounds like, it, it merges with the Sustainable Development Goals from the UN that came out in 2015. Was there looking at those elements as well or, or really independent? Yeah. So, you know, with the, the Sustainable De Development Goals or SDGs um, with the UN, I think that what's interesting about them is that they provide a framing for the right thing, the future of, you know, what it is needs, what it is that we need to be doing as a company, sorry. They, frame, they provide a future for what we need to be doing as a world, as a society at large. And so for me, I have always been motivated by this context of providing access to the most privileged spaces in the world to people who have less privilege. And that's from a personal context as well. Um, as a queer person, an LGBT person, you know, coming into these organizations and these contexts which were very mainstream and very formal um, there were some barriers to accessing that 
And so I always uh, felt like I saw some hidden rules that were going on, and they were more obvious to me as someone who maybe felt like a bit of an outsider. And so I've always been passionate about how to make the keys to the kingdom more accessible. Um, the other thing is I lived abroad in the Dominican Republic for a while um, in my younger years and, and have family down there. And it's, a, you know, that country is challenged by a lot of systemic issues with poverty. And there's not an economic path forward that seems accessible to a lot of people. There's not a path from subsistence um, for a lot of people in that country or even in the United States where I live now um, to something that feels more prosperous and high leverage and exponential, all of these knowledge worker jobs that are celebrated in the Valley. So to me, when you advance digital fluency, you open up conversations about what's possible for people and they start to get more agency and choice to make their own minds up about what technology is a good fit for them and what it might mean for careers or economic development. Again, I, I can see how this uh, very much ties in with, you know, the broader sort of ecosystems that you're dealing with. I noticed in your background that you're also a technology vision board member uh, with Accenture. And Accenture is what the largest, I guess, technology consulting implementation company the largest in the world. consulting in the, one of the top three, at least. Um, you know, I, I won't get into who's the number one, you know, but uh, I think that they're, they're pretty big. Yeah, so I sit on the Accenture Tech Vision Advisory Board, and I, I think it's really interesting. So when we first started with the Tech Vision Advisory Board, um, which is an external advisory board to Accenture's technology leadership that they then plow into thought leadership content that they share with their clients and their partners, um, you know, the, the guidance then was, well, don't go more than about five years out because our clients can only think about three years out. And so we need to make sure that, you know, they understand what the relevant piece is for them right now. And that was challenging for me as a, you know, kind of very futurism focused <laughs> person. Um, but it, it is important because I think that there is a cutoff in strategic planning for most large companies, even those that have a long tail of innovation like automotive. And they don't tend to look out more than a few years because it's really at odds with shareholder expectations. You know, especially with publicly traded companies, there's sometimes a fiduciary responsibility to produce short-term gains. And there's definitely a lot of pressure to do that um, when companies live and breathe by their stock price. So having longer-term goals that go beyond the realm of just impressing shareholders, but are really actually substantive changes, really hard. And a lot of times a leader only gets one shot at that. And if they don't do well at it in a fast enough time period, they're, they're put out. And so the Tech Vision um, Advisory Board I found was very interesting because I felt like I had an opportunity and still do have an opportunity to share content into that, that it creates some of that future pool um, and helps people see where all of this might be going. Um, so I'll pause for a second, but I have another thread to come back to on that too. You know, that uh, again, that's interesting. So I, I can see that very much tying in then with your work with Singularity University and because they're very much into where, where are things going? You know, how, how can you transact in terms of the upcoming, uh, you know, major shifts that are out there and so on. So, and so there's this common thread with all of the uh, work that you're doing. Uh, any, any additional comments about, about Singularity University and the things that you do with them? Um, yeah, so I sit on the faculty at Singularity University, and uh, you know what's interesting about Singularity is that they absolutely have addressed this pull element of the future. They they help people see what's coming, and I, what I appreciate is that a lot of their content is much more focused on possibility than risk and threat. So they don't succumb to a lot of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or FUD, as it's called, like say in the cybersecurity industry. Um, they don't succumb to the FUD piece too much. I think there is a challenge, though, with the fundamental concept of the singularity and the, the concept of singularity as apart from Singularity University, but you can't fully separate them given the, the name um, overlap. The singularity is this idea that humans and machines will merge. And I think that that, um, you know, they'll become like this invisible point where everything is all the same. You know, there will be no line between human and machine. And it sounds awfully like some kind of you know, rapturous, um, you know, the t I call it the tech geek rapture, um, that we can shed these limiting bodies and move into pure mind space. And I, I find that the cyborg conversation is juicier for me personally, because it's more about attending to the messiness. Um, 
you know, and attending to the difficulty uh, and inequality of that technological advance. So I think that the singularity represents this idea of some kind of utopian future. And it has sometimes fallen out of favor in more recent uh, discussions and conversation in the world because people are acknowledging that it's, it's a little too utopic. So what's great about singularity is that they've been evolving over the years and, and really trying to find a way to meet people where they're at with this conversation about digital transformation and how it actually plays out in companies. We often talk about it as the, the what, so what, and now what. And, and a lot of the singularity content in its early days was the what about the cool technology and starting to get into the so what. And these days, in the current financial circumstances and geopolitical circumstances, people are really hungry for the now what. What do I do to be ready? You know, there's so many uh, different ideas here, and uh, but it's more than ideas. You're actually transacting and you're, and you're shaping thought. Um, leaders, I mean, CEOs and companies and so on, and communities worldwide. So just uh, really fascinating. Uh, I'm going to, since we're, you talked a little bit about the future and, and where you see it going, so I'll stay with that theme and then I'll get into cause it and how that how you founded that. And so, so because you've already <laughs> got into some of the sort of the predictions of, of where your uh, things are going. So you know, what What are the major mega trends that you think that people need to uh, pay attention to? Maybe they're not mega trends yet, but will become mega trends in three, maybe three years or four years. And and that, uh, you know, whether they're scientists or business people that, that you know, or, or maybe even society have to pay attention to right now. Yeah. Well, so I think in the in the right now to three years range, um, what we're starting to see is that there are some pretty major shifts that have been underway for a long time, but they're about to hit their exponential curve. So one um, is not like the others. So the first one is this piece of working in a distributed fashion and rethinking what work is or what we cause it, we kind of call it rethinking remote. Um, because the idea of a remote worker and a core worker inside an office um, is, is kind of the wrong dichotomy and we're seeing a lot of pushback to the idea of returning to offices. So that's in the news a lot and people think they have that figured out, but culturally, I don't think we're anywhere near really understanding what the impact of COVID has done to the distribution of knowledge workers globally. Um, a lot of people have moved. I moved during the pandemic um, to a different city. I didn't need to be in the super expensive, um, you know, San Francisco area as much. So I'm in Portland, Oregon. You know, a lot of people have moved around the world. And that's going to cause a huge shift in power dynamics. And I think it's going to really open up space for leaders who are in less developed areas, um, like the tech hubs of India, South Africa, um, Latin America, to be more equal players in corporate environments. And that is gonna really change the dynamics of diversity and how power is represented or perceived inside companies. So I think that's one really big piece. And the just general uh, interconnectivity of a whole bunch of companies having leveled up their digital fluency enough to be in video meetings and, and actually transact uh, globally in that way. So that's the first one, uh, I'll pause to see anything else you want to touch on with that before I talk about some of the other more mega trend things? Yeah, I mean, I, I can, um, I, you know, we, we can see this, we can see the impact of um, just increasingly this engagement. I mean, like us today, right? We're, we're on a, a call where <laughs> that's how interviews are being done. I used today. to be in a studio. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and people are, are willing to say, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, a million dollar production environment. <laughs> right. yeah. it's, it's, it's made it much more accessible. There's this kind of idea of equity and diversity inclusion, but this fairness aspect, I, yeah. I don't want to say um, the, the, the democratization of this because that's an interesting word today with, with things that are going on in the world. So, yeah. but anyways, this sort of equity distribution that's occurring and 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 you know one of the ramifications of that to society do you think that um that that's going to germinate some disruptions as well because Absolutely. of this okay yeah i mean i you know for example i'm working with a large company right now and they contracted with us to do a multi-year digital fluency program that started um 
basically during the pandemic. And it's the first big contract I've ever had to deal with with a big company that didn't have travel expenses in it because there was zero expectation of in-person work together. What that means for how you frame a program around something like digital fluency, for example, is that every piece of content and every experience can be accessible around the world, which is very different than how any of those kinds of conversations happened even two years prior. Um, you know, the idea that everyone would fly to a conference and therefore you have to choose who's worthy to spend all that money on um, really changes things. So having a purely virtual I, I don't love the word because it is real, but uh, having a, a perfectly distributed and online experience, what that means is that large numbers of people from this company's offshore or nearshore environments were participating on an equal level with those who were in headquarters. And it really changed things. And also my key program partner for that was in, you know, in Monterey, Mexico, as opposed to in, you know, um, LA or New York or something like that. And that conversation and having that leader be situated elsewhere also really shaped the conversation. So I think that there are immediate changes that have been happening that are still percolating and that are still being normalized. Um, and and I, I think that this actually connects to one of the other big trends I wanted to talk about, which again, sounds like one we've talked about for a while in the world, which is around AI. But you know, what we're seeing in the news headlines these days amongst the text journals, uh, the text journals and, and what we're seeing in practice every day that people are experiencing is that finally people are going through this shift from spreadsheets to algorithms. And my, a colleague of mine, Mark Bonchek, mentioned that shift to me and I found it really useful. And the shift from spreadsheet to algorithms is really important because the mental model of organizing our data in tables that are static that we download to our computers versus accessing live data and interconnecting data to, to each other, you know, to other data sets and using APIs and cloud native environments more regularly. We've been talking about that for a decade plus, but we're just starting to get to where that's normal. And so that AI upsurge is starting to show up in people's everyday lives in a way that it was not even three years ago. Um, the filter bubble with Facebook is probably the early example of this, but now we're starting to see that kind of intuitiveness or incorrect assumptions and all the bias that goes with that showing up in everything from credit scoring to fraud prevention and everything else. And it's not theoretical anymore. So that I think is the other big trend that has not really been attended to is not how do we build AI, but how do we build AI fluency in everyday people to understand the impact and the, the ethical considerations of sharing their data? And it may be too late for that, so at least understanding the ethical and functional impacts of how AIs are being applied to them so they can advocate for themselves. Yeah, I mean, uh, that in itself is still like a separate interview, you know, the implications sure. of yeah. AI and, and uh, the the augmentation aspect, uh, you know, the future of work and, and how that's changed from what was originally predicted though. There was this idea of loss of jobs, but really it's more augmentation now working and and yeah. and as a companion with, or some sort of uh, partnership with AI in some way, right? So- I think there's like a shift from automation to augmentation. You use right. the term augmenting and I find that really useful. I also have seen people shift AI to IA. So instead of artificial intelligence, it's intelligence augmentation. And I think that that's a useful shift. I mean, articulating things as shifts in mental models is helpful because you can benchmark, is this an AI conversation or is this an IA conversation? You know, is this a spreadsheet conversation or is this an algorithm conversation? So that's a, a useful framing for people. And, and I also, I think there's another shift that, um, again, could be its whole own interview. Um, so you tell me how far you want to go with this, which is, the idea of machine coworkers, right? Um, we often think about, you know, digital technologies as tools, um, but if we're really rethinking the future of work and the future of careers and companies, it's, I think, much more helpful to think of a machine as a junior coworker or maybe a more senior one as the AI skills get better. And that you would never have one department hire all the employees for another department. So why would you have one department pick all of the tools and make all the key decisions about what is running another department? So with IT, you know, picking technology tools, but say finance or HR consuming them, it's off. So what if we put the machines in an org chart 
and we manage their training like we normally would and figure out who's supervising, supervising them and what's the dotted line for thought partnerships that they have. How do they share feedback? You know, the mental model shift of thinking of machines as our coworkers is still really underdeveloped. Again, just a sort of a very interesting ideas. I mean, I'm thinking of the European Union and then they propose these draft uh, regulations, uh, the European Commission about maybe AI have rights and, you know, and what does that mean? Or um, uh, some of these other aspects of the controversies that you've seen this year, you know, where uh, some of the large uh, language models are becoming so sophisticated that where, where does it enter into a, uh, the legislative side, right? Because the because they're so um, real like, right? Or, you know, you see DALE2 uh, mm -hmm. from OpenAI and, and that's- And GPT-3 and yeah. Yeah, and, and then, you know, uh, what does that do to the whole sort of creative process and who owns that creative process? I, I There's so many dimensions to this augmentation side and, and where it's going to go and, and um, you know, the transformational kind of shifts and culture people. Do you have sort of a summary statement of that trend and, and you see people shifting in their ideas and their attitudes about this then? So they think of this as more of a colleague, even though it's a machine and, and not, not so much a tool? I think that we're in the early days of this shift from tools to coworkers when it comes to machines. So machine tools to machine coworkers. I used to say digital coworker, but then people think about a remote colleague and that goes down the wrong road. But so this, this shift from digital tools to machine coworkers is really important. Um, and I think that you know where we're at is right now just acknowledging that that might be happening as opposed to really thinking of it as fully having hit its, uh, you know, its stride yet. Um, probably the early examples of machine coworkers are replacing very entry level or augmenting very entry level knowledge worker jobs. So for example, call center representatives with chatbots or IVR integrated voice response um, or intelligent voice response, you know, that kind of uh, early stages of, of customer service, or we see it with really basic recommendation engines for content. But this idea of having a more free form machine coworker that you can ask natural language questions of and that can anticipate your needs um, is just starting. But there's a piece around digital fluency that has to happen here for people to really hit their stride with that and or not be overtaken by it because there is a real risk of people's jobs going away if they haven't found what their next one is, right? If they haven't found the transition. And there's a, a lot of uh, missing elements of understanding how data works and how it moves from system to system, what I might frame as a data supply chain. Um, and there's a lot of misunderstandings around how machines can or cannot learn um, and what that means. So machines that learn and machine coworkers and framing it in more human terms, I think makes it more accessible for people. But there is some overall digital fluency work we need to do to get people ready for that. Uh, you know, you you have this news about Lambda, right? And then I guess uh, Microsoft has, go, um, I think it's going to, there's an open AI with GPT-3, but there's this evolution, right? It, like GPT-X, you know, what is GPT-5 going to look like? What is uh, Dolly 5 going to look like? What is Lambda version 4 going to look like? Whereas you know, I, I think the current iteration is too... And, and, you know, if you look at some of the NVIDIA presentations, they, they talk about 85 billion neurons and, um, you know, there's over 100 trillion synapses, right? And, and this idea that the language models maybe be next year uh, potentially could have over 100 trillion parameters because that's where it's going, right? So, you know, from the 100, let's say 75 billion parameters, a uh, parameter sort of being a measure of capability of, mm -hmm. of this AI uh, of GPT-3 where it, you know, can generate text and you can uh, add some technology to it so that you have an avatar, you can converse or with Lambda and, and so on. If you go out to next year and, and consider some of the things that NVIDIA is indicating and they're investing heavily, at least on the hardware side and their omniverse side, um, 
where do you see this going? Um, you know, are there limitations, uh, you know, where you're getting the approximation of the complexity uh, of the human brain and the connectome of the human brain? Because, you know, or uh, or unless you go into sort of Penrose's idea, as Roger Penrose's idea of microtubules, and then you go to 10 to the 27th, which is then the octillion size. So, uh, you know, just the whole measure of uh, more sophistication. Right. What does that mean in, in that progression? Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And do, do you think the language models are going to get to that size? And or you see um, deep mind, you know, where they basically have mapped down proteins and uh, virtually any protein, uh, amino acids modeling or, or, or uh, modeling to proteins, they can do this now, right? Including the human uh, system. Yeah. You know, what are the implications of all of this, right? So, Well, there's a lot of questions in what you, you shared there. So one is, you know, do I think it will happen? And another is what are the implications of the near term and what might the implications be of the long term? So do I think it will happen? Uh, it being this kind of almost general uh, intelligence that is maybe still artificial and not necessarily sentient, but can pretty much take any question lobbed at it. I think what we're going to see is something very equivalent to um, the way that Google works, right? Where you have these knowledge graphs and these knowledge cards. Um, so the taxonomy of information and mental models is really important here. Because what Google has gotten really good at, for example, is not just having a rigid taxonomy of where everything is on the web, which was the traditional way of doing search engines, but allowing a folksonomy to emerge. I don't know who coined that term, but I love it. Um, the idea of uh, a taxonomy of the people that is emergent rather than convergent. So there, there's those two things there. So convergent models like taxonomies are premised in some person understanding the knowledge well and thinking that that taxonomy is available to others and accessible to others, right? So data taxonomies are a site where power really is managed in, in cultures because the way that we organize data, say for example, census data and the questions we ask of it, shapes how it's then applied later and then influences the culture that then feeds back into that data. So there's a perpetual loop there. The emergent folksonomies describe the present tense of how people are thinking about, um, and even you know, early weak signals of new thinking, about how people are thinking about or organizing thoughts and information. So Google has gotten good at allowing you to ask a question of Google, and then it finds all the searches that more or less correspond to that, even if they don't have that exact phrase. Facebook, you know, and Instagram and all the other social stuff out there, Twitter, the tags are the folksonomy in part. What we haven't gotten good at with a lot of technology is instead of convergent or emergent, the divergent. So there's not a lot of time spent, comparatively speaking, in figuring out how to do new ideas or spot new patterns. So this is where unsupervised machine learning um, can see patterns that we might not have seen and find associations we may not have seen. But if we force the results of that unsupervised machine learning back into a convergent taxonomy, what you do is you get groupthink. Um, and where this shows up in language models, since you asked about that, is really important to me because language models both represent a culture Right? Knowing words in a language is not the same as having fluency in it, just like knowing buzzwords in tech is not the same as having digital fluency. So when you have language models that are very English-centric or Eurocentric um, or any culture-centric, what they do is they impose the thinking and mental models of the software developers and linguists working on them onto the people using that tool, and you see erasure happen. So I was recently uh, in a conversation about bringing digital fluency content to Timor Leste, and the primary Eurocentric language there is Portuguese, but the, you know, the language used by most of the people there, if, if I'm even pronouncing it right, is Titum. And um, that, you know, that language does not exist in your average translation software. I can't auto-translate my content over to that. So what it does is mean that any turns of phrase and localization and important things that are happening there then require a human translator to work on, which either shuts people out, raises the costs, or doesn't include them in some way. If you expand that at a macro level, the mental models and thinking of different cultures or different types of people, if they're not included in the machine learning models, um, they will get drowned out by the group think and the normalization that comes from the high expense of creating some kind of central model. 
Mm, that's, you know, really, really interesting, um, you know, what you've indicated there. And and I guess the uh, we have to be mindful of this sort of very nuanced conversation and, and I guess put controls in in some way. So this lends to this idea, do you think there should be more regulation around this then and, and policies that are baked in? And, and that's that tension, right? If, if you get too much of that, will it stifle innovation? What are your views on that? Yeah, so rules and laws are about what you can't do generally or occasionally what you must do. So they preordain answers to something and they're based in the fundamental belief that you know all the circumstances. So setting out laws for how to operate on the road generally works because we know how the roads were built and the roads are not going to get rebuilt overnight, at least until robot road builders come along um, and reconfigurable buildings that move themselves. But we'll get there another day. But that is a, a very convergent thinking, right? Um, another way to think about this is decision principles, which instead of being restrictive are more generative. So if you look at Agile, um, and Agile software development, what they set out were principles like, instead of comprehensive documentation, focus on the customer's experience, right? Um, you know, or working software, I think was the trade-off they did. So focus on working software over comprehensive documentation. That is generative. It says, if you have to choose between these two, go this route. And what we need in AI, and we are seeing this in, in major thought leaders and um, thought partnerships in this space, um, is this generative thing of please do this, make sure to include these people, include this kind of space for um, you know, model checking in your process of, of checking the mental models that are used in the, in the AI process overall. Um, and it's tricky, right? So in a typical company, you're seeing, okay, there's a data team, right? And they have the nuance and skills, ideally, to be able to do the data science work and they know how to identify what's going on in an algorithmic model. But then you have people at the edges of the organization who know the people who are affected by the model. So you have to build a thought partnership between highly skilled data scientists and maybe less technically skilled, but more people fluent or thinking fluent, um, you know, edges of the network that are interacting with the stakeholders who are affected. So we need not just regulation, but a lot more principles around feedback loops from humans into machines. Think AI coach and AI teacher rather than AI coder. Yeah, I, I guess again, you know, you, you have um, what over 300 AI principles and frameworks and so on. And then there's this movement to the operation, uh, operation operalization of this operate uh, anyways the 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 usage of it right um and and you see that with UNESCO and the recommendations on, on the use of AI or uh you see that with the IEEE and their P7000 which came out now a couple of years ago or at the ISO you know yeah, we wrote a universal code of data ethics about informed consent right. and doing no harm with Accenture um, and published it under Creative Commons because we wanted people to go iterate off of it. Uh, right. I think that we're in that divergent space right now, and we'll get more convergent principles that maybe won't be as simplified as Asimov's three laws of robotics, but um, will be more accessible to everyday people the way that the agile principles are, right? And then there'll be applications of them that are nuanced per context. You know, I'm just conscious of time. Are you hard bound but with an hour or, or can, we can go uh, I can further? Go a little bit longer. I have a, a session I'm teaching at one. I need to do a little bit of prep for that. Okay. okay. Um, so that's um, two hours and 15 minutes from now. So I can do like another 45 minutes. Okay. That's good to know. Um, there, just again on, on the, on the trends uh, sort of conversation, um, do you think about, you know, it, we're, we have exascale supercomputers and which means you can tackle really interesting problems. Uh, ex, exascale meaning um, you can do a billion, billion operations per second. And and some people are even thinking, well, maybe we're going to hit zettascale at some point, right? Which is a thousand billion, billion operations. It's kind of mind blowing ideas. And then there's hybrid uh, models where you're, where you have supercomputing working with quantum computing quantum is still very early and 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 i'm thinking maybe even analog uh, capability you see more and more instances of analog 
and and uh, and much. building these hybrid systems. And I, you know, Oak Ridge is doing some of this. Uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratories in the U.S. They already have Exascale, and Exascale came out last year. Mm -hmm. do, do you think about all of those implications as well from a trend standpoint and what that's going to do? Uh, yeah. For us? Well, you know, if I answer this from the cyborg anthropology and futurism angle, I have a lot of nerdery that I'd love to do, and I'm not um, a chip designer or anything else like that. Um, before we dive into this, I want to come back to something you asked about, which is regulation with AI. Um, and just I want to close that loop if that's all right. So with AI and regulation, one of the things that I think needs to happen is raising the digital fluency of legislative bodies and policy setting bodies um, so that they better understand what they're doing. So we saw this in Texas. Um, there was essentially, um, you know, people were trying to come after Facebook for hosting content that was critical of someone um, in, a, I think it was in a libel suit or something like that. And it's this fundamental lack of understanding of the operating models and business models of the internet um, is a barrier there. So if you try and think about legislators like that, then trying to understand and make a policy around AI, um, it gets very tricky. What I don't wanna see is, for example, the anti-woke movement thing that's happening in conservative US and other cultures collide with AI. I mean, that would be, you know, the AI conversations, if you start legislating speech in the context of AI, it gets really tricky really quickly because of the impact and the kind of exponential impact. We see the digital equivalent of book banning um, and book burning that's going on in the US right now, um, playing out in AI, really problematic. So I think that raising the digital fluency of legislators and their policy advisors is important. Um, there's, a, there's a responsibility uh, that you know, people play hot potato with or no one wants to catch it that's coming from, you know, is it big tech's problem to do that? Is it someone else's? Is it academia? Is it think tanks? Is it, you know, the legislators themselves? Whose job is that digital fluency for legislators and, and policy setters? The other piece that comes up around regulation that I saw a headline about the other day, I have to go dig it up, was the idea of creating an AI compensation fund so that when something goes wrong, uh, with AI, which is not if, but when. When something goes wrong with AI, uh, whether it's in predictive sentencing um, or in the criminal space or it's in credit decisions or something else, that there's a way to recalibrate and even the playing field as much as po possible for people who were negatively impacted by that. And I think that that is a really challenging but useful conversation to have, is framing AI just like a human as something that can do good or can do bad and having those victim compensation funds, just like we would for um, you know, vaccines that were improperly designed. It's a way to lessen people's fear about participating in systems that involve um, newer science or newer applications of science. So I think we need to, to really go down that route with AI as well. So coming back to your questions about um, exascale computing and quantum computing and the impact, I think that um, we have to distinguish between what is available to the masses versus what is available in very targeted research environments. Right now, as of the time of this interview, quantum is not regularly able to perform tasks better than an equivalent, um, you know, digital computer is in most situations and certainly is not more cost effective. I do think that there's a lot of promise with quantum. I don't know how far we're gonna get there or if it will be a like nuclear fission fusion kind of conversation that just lingers for a very long time before we reach that scale. However, I do know that our um, ability to create traditional processors um, is, is running out. We're, we're not, sorry, to, to create innovation with traditional processors is seeming to run out. So, you know, we're seeing uh, the nanometer process or the, the thickness of the circuitry on various chips going from something like 17 nanometers just a few years ago down to as low as you know five or even three nanometers in the current consumer grade Apple chips. And if you look at going much below that, you start to run into quantum interference. So we're running out of chip space, um, uh, the ability to create these concentrated high speed chips. We're running out of innovation space with that. Uh, so. I think that there's a couple implications. One is 
we have great processors coming out. I mean, the, the Apple M1 and M2 processors are stunning for their their efficacy at a price point that's accessible to people. Um, Intel, I'm sure, is you know continuing to work on that. Lots of other chip makers are. So you're you're creating better edge computing devices that use lower energy, which is great. But if we run out of room for that processing on devices, the focus on cloud computing also means that concentration of power in cloud comp computing providers and that their models and their data centers are um, influencing a lot of conversations um, that you know individuals can't afford. So I think that there's something there from an ethical perspective to explore. And I don't think that exascale and quantum is gonna be accessible to everyday people for a while, um, but that we'll see that major uptick in you know, five, 10 years maybe, I don't know. I'm not the data science expert for that, or sorry, the, the chip science expert, but that this conversation about rethinking the future of work um, and these more tangible conversations around machine coworkers that we mentioned earlier and the digital fluency that goes with them is really important to prepare people for what might come with Exascale and other um, broader applications of supercomputing. You know, I, I, that's an um, interesting idea. You, you, know, you presented some really interesting uh, perspectives. There is in Asia, the loudest, uh, or probably the largest integration of supercomputing into the cloud. They figured it out, even though the architectures are different. And so that capability is now being distributed on a massive, more broader basis. So beyond research so that you have more accessibility uh, to any kind of uh, capability. Um, so uh, that region is actually ahead uh, any other region in the world. On Are the you chips, specifically referring to China or Asia yeah, 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 to China. I just uh, you know I don't want trigger words <laughs> you know coming up, but it is. Um, so it's 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 interesting, and then this sort of you know what what are the dynamics of that and that uh, sort of uh, capability versus other countries is kind of an idea that I'm just leaving for the audience. On the chips side, I, I do have a conversation upcoming uh, with Philip Wong, who won the top IEEE award, and uh, and he's at Stanford. And then he had a uh, he was um, uh, wor worked with uh, took a couple of years to work with uh, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, which is the largest uh, chip fabrication uh, company, and and he still is the chief scientific uh, um, advisor to them, though he's back at Stanford. But there's this area of, of um, you know, 3D stacking, uh, using a kind of uh, RAM called resistive RAM and integrating it within the architecture itself. So you're mm -hmm. then, you don't have these limitations, much lower power, much, much more higher capability. And then of course the integration of photo photonic chips or, uh, you know, the whole photonic technology. So there's this idea that we, maybe we won't hit this limit uh, just due to other kinds of thinking and even new material science. So I just want to sort of refer that to the audience uh, when I do the interview with him. And in fact, I'm doing that uh, yeah, because he won this award. That because I want to know more about that stuff. You know, I, I get asked from clients all the time, what is the future of chipsets and computing? And I'm like, I have to draw the line. I know a lot of things about a lot of things, but I don't have depth in the, the chip science and hard science side of that. Um, and the implications for machine coworkers are really important, um, for sure. I think that the system on the chip context of what M1 is doing with the Apple's M1 and M2 processors, right. the power of that system on a chip is really, really important. Tangibly, simple example, um, I edit video all the time. It used to be to you know deal with exporting and, and editing a 4K video on my computer, even with a loaded top of the line Intel maxed out MacBook from 2019. It was constantly running its fan, which means it's generating a lot of heat, which means it's using a lot of energy and it would overheat and stall out and die all the time, um, despite everyone's best efforts. Now with the M1 and M2, I'm using one tenth of the energy in my computer to do the same thing. Not that relevant on desktop computers because people don't think about a shortage of energy, at least in privileged environments, about the desktop computer they have. Super relevant in mobile computers. So when you think about the processing power of a phone and the hyperspeed connectivity of 5G, true 5G, um, the ability to engage with three-dimensional environments and augmented reality and a more realistic metaverse in the way that Neil Gibson originally, uh, or sorry, mixing names, 
more realistic metaverse in the way that Neil Stevenson originally intended the concept to be in his book Snow Crash. This seamlessness between digital and analog or live and virtual environments, that's going to be heavily democratized for sure by new chip advances. Whether that will get to true AI on a chip um, in a way that is more useful for people remains to be seen, I think. And I'm really curious to hear from your, your other interviewees how, how they view that going. You know, there was a recent announcement out of a, a research team, again, from Stanford and working in with others where they're using this new resistive hybrid integration all in one. And uh, so much faster, much lower power. Um, mm -hmm. You just need to get um, um, more progress on the resistive RAM, right? And then the implications of that, but it's also uh, tailored for uh, AI or neural uh, architecture. So neuromorphic computing is all integrated within this capability. And and I've been looking at Phil, Philip Swong's work and he really has all of it in place. And it, I, I, it's just a matter of now scaling this and from a commercialization standpoint, just getting the costs down. So the, the working prototypes are there and just getting uh, the natural progression uh, where they can get higher yields in these different areas, and then it's going to proliferate. And it'll have an impact, I think, even on the deep south, right? Or on the global south, this idea that's uh, proliferation throughout the world, maybe even in feature phones at some point, so it's not just high-end uh, devices. So so you bring up some, some really interesting ideas, including on the M1, M2. And in fact, I, I did a um, an interview with... Um, uh, with John John Hennessy, uh, you know, uh, used to be the president uh, of Stanford, and he won a Turing Award for chips uh, uh, at risk architecture, which is in, involved with what over ninety nine percent of chips that are really based on his sort of thinking back in the seventies and eighties. And I remember when those came out with uh, the power PC chips with IBM, Motorola, and Apple, and how that revolutionized the Apple computing environment at the time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he even remarked, and I, I hope I'm not I'm sort of misquoting him, but he sort of remarked that it was, you know, quite interesting with the M1, you know, what was happening there, right? And here's a gentleman who just whole history is in chips, and I encourage people just to look at that past interview. Yeah. <laughs> they, they can get his exact thoughts, but uh, so I think it, you're right. I mean, I agree, or I think the marketplace agrees that some really interesting innovation occurring there and the implications of the innovation with what's happening with the M1 and M2, and then uh, let's call it MX and what the what the end, end outcome is gonna be. And then other players who are gonna to have to look at that. I wanna go back now, cause you mentioned augmented reality and virtual reality in this aspect of uh, new chips and the implications that's gonna have. And so the context here then is, and it ties into some of the other things you said as well. So um, I feel that, you know, we, we, we've got, um, uh, sixty percent or close to sixty percent, I believe it's going to be over next year of adoption of the internet across the world, right? So it was in the fifties, but I believe it's going to be in the sixties, uh, either this late this year or sometime next year. We've got this idea that people are spending over six hours on a mobile device, mm -hmm. and and uh, it's not decreasing; it's increasing. And you know what are the implications of that? And then that ties into this idea of the metaverse or this um, living in a, a dirt, uh, virtual environment. And then again, this touches into earlier, what are the implications of us talking like this? And there was uh, an interesting workshop put on by the uh, MIT and the Fluid Interfaces Research Group and Patty Mays. And they, they're they looking at these questions and they're looking at it for the past three decades. and because you can't pick up all of the cues, um, even when a, in, a, in a digital meeting, perhaps you can do that in, an, in a metaverse environment where you can see the total body, the uh, reaction, you know, the, the how the feet are pointing perhaps, or all of the other subtle cues that our brains are programmed to, uh, to see what, you know, to build that relationship or to, or to read the, the cues and and, the, and some of the interesting work they're releasing in this area. So I'd like to get your views then, and then we'll get into uh, cause it, but, but this idea of the metaverse and some of the idea, you know, where do you see that going and, and what are the implications of it, right? So. Yeah, 
Uh, well, I remember when I talked to my thesis advisor, um, Dr. Deborah Heath, uh, around cyborg anthropology. She was a great advisor for me, and I looked at um, in my thesis, I was looking at cyborgs in the context of bikes. So when we ride a bicycle, it's a non-digital cyborg. It extends us. We see so much more. We can do so much more. But it also changes us. Like our body mechanics change. Our view of the city has to change. Our way of processing information has to be faster than if we're just walking. So it's this site of interface. And Brendan Hookway, um, who wrote a book that has been published by MIT Press called Interface, points to the fact that um, interface as a term, which we use in technology primarily today, actually comes from hydrodynamics. And that where two bodies of water or other fluid meet, a third entity is created. And it's, the, it's neither you know, water source A or B, it's this third thing, it's C. And it's where the two intermingle, and they both change um, because of their intermingling with this interface. The same thing is true with human beings. So when we have to adapt ourselves to touch the digital technology, and when the digital technology has been adapted or even self-adapts in the future to how we touch it, um, there is a third thing that happens that is our cyborg self. It is neither just the human side nor just the machine side, it's both. Common example would be that keyboards on your phone, if you try and use someone else's phone, even if it's the same model, the keyboard will feel weird. And it's because the keyboards are adapting to your finger size and shape. I notice it if I forget to cut my fingernails for a while and they grow out and then I cut them, all of a sudden my typing accuracy is awful because the phone has adapted to me typing with the edges of my finger instead of the, the thumb. And so when we, we look at these interfaces, that third entity that's created is not supposed to be either one or the other. It is the mixing of the two. So when we look at online work um, and you know online connection and relationship, there's a different kind of uh, nonverbal communication that goes on, and a different level and literalness um, of verbal communication. So what I mean by this is that there's a performative nature of displaying our emotions. There was a skill set, and when we talk about digital fluency and you know the thinking, all this other stuff that goes with it, one of the sections is skills. It's not just technical skills. It's interpersonal skills that have to adapt. So the idea of people being better at communicating their emotional state in text or words has gotten really important. It started with email, but it's really become quite important when you have chat windows and you have live video and we have emoji and react emoji as a way to engage in nonverbal communication. So on one end, we have this performative element of emotion, which sometimes is what we think we're supposed to be emoting versus what we actually are feeling, but that's been happening at work for a long time anyway. On the other side, we have these machine technologies that can sense more about our emotions from facial recognition and facial pattern mapping or the way that we're holding our shoulders or how low our voice is and if it's stressed and kind of, you know, is it down in the diaphragm or is it up in the head, you know? <laughs> so machines can sense this and support us in displaying that or emoting in that way online. Um, I think that what we're going to find and what is so juicy about the context of the metaverse is that it's not a virtual reality that's supposed to look just like what was happening in the physical world. It's a different reality where avatars and performative expression, more conscious expression is happening. Trying to expect it to operate by the virtual world rules is not going to be the same. We saw this, there's an article recently, I don't know if it was the New York Times or somewhere else, where there's like the, um, a significant decline in the number of people who have work friends. Because when you don't have to go to lunch with people or you're not going to the bar at the end of the day because they're right there, the number of work friends people have in a typical corporate environment seems to be going down. And I think that we'll see variations on this happen where people are mode switching or in diversity and equity and inclusion discussions called code switching, where they're code switching into work mode or not work mode and their avatars, their facial expression settings, all this other stuff are going to be correlated to the professional norms. So whether that means more diversity of expression or it means a normalizing is something that we need to engage from an ethical discussion perspective.
you know, you would be fascinated then with her research team, uh, Patty Mays at the Fluid Interfaces uh, at MIT. BB when you said Fluid Interfaces, I'm like, I bet they've talked to this person that wrote this other book. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, yeah. I mean, there's so much uh, confluence between what you're saying and the work that they're doing. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, you, you would have a great time uh, to talking to them or sharing with them. Uh, Okay, let's yeah. get to cause it, uh, you know, and let's do a chime check. You're probably, what, 15 minutes left or something like that? Uh, I can do up to 25 minutes okay. if we need to. Okay, so uh, how did it start? What, uh, yeah. you know, what what was that journey like? Yeah, and yeah. Then, and then, you know, what are your... What are your goals? I mean, and uh, but we'll we'll mind those granular sort of questions. Yeah. But how did it start first of all? Well, um, let me maybe start with what it is, and then I'll explain how we got there. So, Causet is a futurist think tank whose tangible work is raising digital fluency in companies. So, what we do is look at all this far future stuff that we've been talking <laughs> about in today's interview, for example, and then figure out what does that mean for people in the corporate environment or the organizational environment, if they work in a foundation or a university or something like that. And we're also fascinated with what the personal implications are, but we tend not to get paid for that because people are not you know, coming to say, I wanna engage in a digital fluency program for myself or whatever. So what the work really looks like is understanding the impact of the technology on the people um, and in other words, the cyborg that is going on at the interface of technology and the human, often in a workplace or in some kind of working project. And that digital fluency that we've talked about before is really what we've found is the site of change. Because there is a lot of conversation about what the tools are and the digital technologies or how data is working. There's not as much about what the value models or business models are doing, what the thinking is, um, you know, evolving into how we engage in new skill sets. So those five pillars of digital fluency of thinking, skills, tools, data, and business models are really the ones that we try and focus on as the site of change um, for people going beyond having a few key phrases about digital into having this deeper fluency. Because flu fluency in technology or digital, it connotes just the same thing as it does in language. It's not just knowing a few buzzwords, like you have a phrase book on a, on a touristy vacation. It's understanding the culture and the context and also building your ability to self-teach, to be an autodidact um, who can adapt and evolve in new environments and learn the language as a living language rather than reciting pieces from a book. So Causet came from this idea of wanting to not be at the effect of the world, but actually causing new things in the world. Um, a lot of times people focus on what might be called a have, do, be progression. I have a laptop with graphic design software, then I do some design and photo editing, then I'm creative and self-expressed, as opposed to a be, do, have kind of progression, which is saying, I'm creative and self-expressed. What are all the things I could do in line with that? And then the results will come kind of more naturally from that. So we wanted people to not be at the effect of what's happening in their workplaces or their careers or technology, but instead be at the cause of it. Hence, cause it. So I, I got the domain without knowing where it was gonna go or even that it was gonna be a business, causeit.org, um, a long time ago. And then it has evolved over time and, and started as a small business coaching firm and then evolved into more design and um, content and then corporate consulting and organizational change, team alignment, and really then fully came uh, into integration with my background as a cyborg anthropologist as I started doing more work with companies like NTT Group to bridge that human and technological element. So now that has become really the meat of what we're doing. Um, and that's really what cause it's about. I mean, the timing, uh, you've been doing this for a while, but if you look at what's happening today, you're like... <laughs> <laughs> at the perfect hub for all yeah. of these uh, conversations that are going on and narratives. And I I know you're shifting this across uh, hundreds of global enterprises. We mentioned NTNT, there's Accenture, which we mentioned earlier, but you're doing with Volkswagen, uh, the Gates Foundation, Swift, and uh, financial groups, media companies, and so on. So ultimately, um, where do you want Causet to go? I mean, what is Causet going to look like in 2025? 
2025, I can maybe guess. I'm not sure about beyond that because it keeps evolving. Um, so there's a couple of us in the company. It's not just me. So we're, we're kind of boutique and, and very focused. But our plan in the long run is to create a network of change makers in digital fluency in lots of different places. So we have done a couple things in that end. So one, to de-emphasize any one presenter or thinker, we've really published as much of our content as we can in our living book. We call it the Cause of Guide to Digital Fluency or the Digital Fluency Field Guide. And so there's about 100,000 words of content there right now organized into these guidebooks that are emphasizing a key mental model shift or aha moment that people need to have that they can then apply on their own. But what we want to do is continue to bring in new content from others to build out that network of tooling. It's the convergent thinking about how all this works. From the divergent thinking perspective and emergent thinking, we have these sightings from the field, which are places where content that's out on the web or whatever else gets annotated and contextualized so that people can understand um, sightings of this particular mental model or change. So you mentioned, for example, the rise of supercomputing in, in various Asian countries, um, or we might talk about the proliferation of a stronger computing power in smartphones in, um, you know, the, I, I, I don't love the global south as a term, but in Latin America, in, in other places that are not usually thought of as the absolute tech hub or tech center. And I think that those sightings are the way to democratize this discussion around digital fluency. And then as things emerge, we can then start to have some convergent pieces that are useful for people. Um, where I also see this playing out is that, you know, Causet gets paid by large organizations to help them raise their digital fluency in service of what is broadly called digital transformation. So creating new digital products and services, streamlining their operations, creating entirely new business models. And that's hard for companies to do, so it's worth investing in that digital fluency as a baseline so that all the investments they're doing in core technologies or new people are not wasted by having a lack of aligned language and, and directionality. But that work then funds and makes available the content to the public and to different environments and to localize it. Um, so for example, we had a company who needed the content to be available in Latin American Spanish, Canadian French, Brazilian Portuguese, et cetera. So now all of our content is available with professional translation into those languages, which also, not so much Canadian French, but French in general, um, all of those languages are also in places that don't usually get as much tech content and digital fluency content that are not usually included as a primary um, player in those transformations. So that's our hack is to, you know, take the needs of the corporate companies and use that to fund not just their own transformation, but the more global democratization of the discussion. There's a lot of synchronicity between what you're doing then and with your digital fluency guide and cause it your mission, your goals, and where you're, you know, you're working with across so many different enterprises, including foundations, as I mentioned, the Gates Foundation, but also across business. There's a this perfect alignment with the AI for Good, this program uh, with the uh, UNITU. Uh, have you done any work with them at all or any? I think I've run into some folks from AI for Good at various conferences. Um, I haven't been working directly with them, but I think this is one of the things that is um, important around having shared purpose is that you don't have to have it all be in the same place, right? That we have this common purpose. We have different paths to it, right? So AI for Good sets out principles and uh, like we talked about before, these decision principles and guides for what AI should be doing and how it can be better for humanity, um, how to democratize access to that. Um, our part of you know advancing the, the world's kind of readiness for the future or in, in moving the way forward you know, is around this digital fluency piece more broadly. So people understand the business impacts and business um, forces that are uh, being enacted, not just upon companies, but on the individuals that they serve or that they affect. So I think there's a lot of synchronicity out there. There's a lot of people trying to inform the way forward or make the future clear. Have, have you worked with the ITU at all? The, the... I haven't had the opportunity yet. Yeah, uh, I hope to. It sounds like a great group. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give some context to the audience and maybe we can just mind this a little further. Uh, it's a UN agency, but they they date back to 100. Um, they be, they're 157 years old now. I think they were founded in 1865, 
And the reason is, is that um, even, you know, 157 years ago, you needed some kind of organization to manage technology standards. And that's sort of their route. Uh, mm -hmm. So it could be adopted uh, across the world. They're now a UN agency, but they're, they're unique. I was going to say, they, doesn't that predate the UN? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and, and they're unique because they work across 193 co country governments, because when they produce standards, the governments have to be collaborators and all that. They have 900 corporations, organizations, foundations, and research institutes that also belong to the community because, because they, they deal with standards and, and so okay. on. And the AI for Good program, uh, which they uh, are the founding host, is daily content. So they have daily programming, which would be bringing in uh, experts and people with your kind of background to do plenary sort of talks. They do this every day. And um, they have an innovation factory, which is uh, one of the largest open source innovation startup programs where you can apply and compete. I know, because I'm the judge at the finals in December. <laughs> And uh, they have focus groups. They have about nine focus groups, which are where they take AI and apply it to healthcare with the World Health Organization on solutions. They have one on AI and machine learning and 5G. They have one on autonomous uh, driving. I mean, they have all these different categories, which is about the practical implementation of AI for good purposes that fits with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm just thinking there's such a um, perfect, in, you know, uh, so, as I mentioned, synchronicity between what you're doing and what they're doing. So just uh, what I'll do is I'll do an introduction and then you can see if maybe there's a way that you can amplify each other. They can definitely have the, um, they definitely have the capability to amplify what you're doing. Um, their audience is over 3 billion right now. They work with all the major media groups. They're the only UN agency that's able to bring together all the other UN agencies because they're really independent uh, mm -hmm. of each other. Like the World Food Program is an independent program. UNESCO is an independent program uh, under this sort of umbrella of the UN, but really they're independent agencies. They have their own funding and so on. But their partners are also um, all, uh, 40 other UN agencies in this program called AI for Good. So, uh, so that could be uh, an action item for me. I can, I can do an introduction. I'm thinking there's another group called the Knowledge Impact Network, which is a uh, uh, founded by CEOs. But they do they'd be I think they'd be interested in what you're doing and seeing if they can integrate between their projects and, and what you're doing. So that's another um, sort of post interview uh, introduction I can do. I'm just sort of brainstorming based yeah, on this would all be great. <laughs> yeah, and I think that there's you know um, if I can go kind of to a different topic that's related to this, uh, you know, I opened the ITU page and they, the first thing that it said was something about, um, let me see what the woman at the negotiation table. And I think that, you know, there's, there's a, a double-edged sword with standards groups. So standards groups do a great deal to organize um, and level the playing field for different companies, right? So if everyone subscribes to, or by regulation is required to, to adhere to certain standards, it means that it can help everyone be a better actor um, when we think about ethical issues. And also it can just mean, you know, avoiding a lot of wasted work from competing uh, standards or a lack of standards altogether. So I, I love standards groups. There's also a challenge with standards groups is that they're highly focused on convergent thinking from established players. So I'm, I'm glad to see that ITU is focusing on making sure that there is a, a plurality of voices um, included in these standards. And, you know, when we look at telecom, for example, one of the standards things that um, became regulation in the U.S. is that there had to be lifeline service for people with limited income, right, so that there was telecommunications access. We're seeing this with access to broadband more broadly in the U.S., um, where we have a major digital divide that's going on, where there's a lack of access to digital um, content and services because of either telecom monopolies or just how spread out the country is. So I think that there's a huge opportunity that, that many standards groups are pursuing, but that I want to continue to see to broaden the conversation around various stakeholders to think through future impacts and future possibilities beyond the frame of what those who are already in some positions of power are thinking about. 
Um, and there's, there's an opportunity to do what I would frame in my world as queering technology, uh, which is challenging some assumptions about the, the underlying model or mental model that we're looking at with a given technology. So if you, um, for example, queer technology when it comes to the data world and data ethics, we would have avoided some of the missteps that say Facebook had around its real names policy where they only used um, legal names that people had and it invisibilized indigenous people, transgender people, people who were fleeing domestic violence, things like that, um, or who were using languages that uh, Facebook's language tools didn't understand. So including more people at the table generally makes everything better in the long run. I think there's a huge opportunity for that in standards. Uh, the the um, ITU is also involved in uh, laying some of the basis for smart cities. Uh, uh, a major project for them is connectivity. So again, mm -hmm. making and financial inclusion. So uh, for example, this past week, I just did an interview with one of their leaders and um, this leader was able to initiate more financial inclusion programs. At the time, there was 1.7 billion um, people who were not part of the mainstream but had mobile phones and they brought in 1.2 billion of those into financial inclusion which they had no access at that time of this 1.7 uh, billion who were excluded even though they had mobile access right so uh and so they're very much interested in improving connectivity uh, around the world and things like that and then financial inclusion health inclusion they work on that um so a lot, lot of the, uh, well, actually all of the areas that you mentioned, they very much are deeply uh, involved in those areas. Yeah. Well, and, and the I reason I know is because, <laughs> go ahead. I was saying that's one of the things that we saw with leapfrogging, right? So this idea of mobile phone penetration and, and percentage of use in Africa was higher than in many developed countries right. um, in their you know, early to mid days in mobile um, because it's solved for a connectivity and infrastructure issue that was bigger there than it was in, say, the U.S., where most households, or if not all of them, had landlines. So, yeah, I, I, that was one of the huge learnings. So when I was working with um, Swift's innovation team, and then uh, which was called InnoTribe at the time, and then that later turned into this Digital Financial Services for Poverty Alleviation Program um, with the Gates Foundation, that that um, that was very much about saying, hey, let's challenge some assumptions about that the backbones are of financial systems have to be centralized. Um, what if they were more decentralized? And this was way before anyone was talking about Bitcoin, um, but they were a big part of advancing that discussion. And it, it got to the point where, you know, Bill Gates came in and was involved with the project um, and kind of got an update on it and then went to speak at the SWIFT conference, uh, CYBOS, about what they had developed. And this financial allevi uh, poverty alleviation platform had essentially kind of reinvented the transit architecture of SWIFT, which was itself a telco or central network for the banks. And so I think that that innovation from the edge or that emergent thinking that comes up is really important. I, I actually really appreciated how that project included people from a lot of different backgrounds to democratize the voices um, of who was included. You know, and that's part of why I was included in that discussion, not because I was an expert in telecom or um, advanced financial systems, but because, you know, we were asking these cyborg-y kind of questions about how does this change culture? You know, the, the um, you know, some of the insights you're giving here, so, somebody that you may want to connect with is Michael Meehan, and he chairs the um, Sustainability Finance Group, uh, the ESG Sustainability Finance Group. Um, they have something like 15 trillion in assets under management. And my sense in, in working with them is that they have a real problem finding trusted venues where they can deploy capital and, and you know, um, provide all of this equitable access and so on. And um, another one would be Equity Bank out of Africa. I can see a lot of the things that they're working on would tie in with the work you're doing as well. So, so there's a lot of uh, funding in the ESG side, but they're looking for ways where it can be trustedly deployed and and looking at the ramifications of that. So you're not disrupting when you're doing what you think is deployment for good purposes, right? You know, thinking deeply about what are the outcomes. We're, we're in the last couple of minutes. Um, so 
Uh, so we have, I have one final question. And <laughs> the final question is, is uh, you know, what are your recommendations to the audience or your final thoughts to the audience? Oh, uh, I mean, I, there's so many things, but um, the first is get curious about not just the technology, but the why of the technology. So who are the players that are influencing a given technology and what do they have to gain from it? What might that inform about your own choices about whether to engage in it? So I, we've you know, touched on uh, the metaverse, which is a, a term that came from Neil Stevenson, a sci-fi author. Another term that I think he coined was this idea of omistics, which was um, the Amish test for cultural fit with new technologies. Like, so um, in that culture, which is imperfect by like all cultures, but one of the things that they, they do really well, I think, is say, okay, is this technology in line with our values? Okay, so maybe we'll have a computer, but only in the library, not in the home. Or maybe we'll have access to cars, but only for emergency services, not for day-to-day -day transportation. And that testing of technology for cultural fit requires a certain level of digital fluency in what the technology is in the first place. So curiosity, um, this kind of omistic thing of testing for cultural fit with tech, those are both really important conversations. The other uh, way to think about this is what are the mental models or ways of thinking associated with key technologies? Right, so that shift from spreadsheet to algorithms that we talked about earlier, that's an important one to understand that there's a fundamentally different way to manage and process information that we need to be fluent in, in order to really tap into the potential of AI. Because otherwise what we do with technologies is just a faster, better or cheaper version of the old way of doing things. The first thing we did with the Gutenberg Press was print more Bibles, which was a revolution of its own in its own right. It democratized access to religion out of just the clergy by making more of it available. But the real revolution that came from that, I would say, is the publishing revolution. And that didn't come until much later. And it's because we use these technologies for faster, better, cheaper versions of our old mental models um, that the sooner we transform our mental models, the sooner we get these big exponential results. And that's when we ask questions about exascale computing or the future of AI, I always go first to, are we thinking about this right? Um, so I really wanna emphasize that thinking, that curiosity. And then the, the final piece I'd share about this whole conversation of digital fluency more broadly is building thought partnerships with people where you can ask uncomfortable or imperfect questions without feeling like you are gonna look bad at work or something like that. Building an ongoing network of people and incoming sources of content around your own digital fluency is something that we should all, I think, be doing. Um, because if we wait for someone else to upgrade our digital fluency for us, it doesn't tend to go any better than, um, you know, waiting for someone else to suddenly make you good at speaking a new language. Um, so I think that we need to, to claim that as an important piece of our life in this ever accelerating digital world that we live in. You know, MJ, uh, just a fascinating journey for about an hour and a half with you. And I, I mean, I could spend an entire day. <laughs> you, Damn, I you, didn't even get to ask you any questions. Like, wait till I interview you. I'm sure that'll go a while, too. You're doing just amazing work, outstanding work. I recommend the audience uh, drill deep into what you're doing, support it, and so on. It's just uh, outstanding. It's remarkable. It's, it's reverberating <laughs> in every yeah. dimension I can think of. So thank you again for coming in and sharing so many of your insights with the audience. And just a reminder, this was unscripted. So we're just, uh, just going for <laughs> wheeling it. off each other. Yeah. So, you know, thank you again. Yeah. Well, and definitely, you know, um, we make a big chunk of our content available for free on the Digital Fluency Guide website. So that's just digitalfluency.guide. Um, and that's a mobile friendly multi language site where you can check out a lot of this. Um, and then, of course, you know, on our site, just reach out to us. Uh, our site's causeit.org. Um, we'd love to have these kinds of conversations with you, too. So let us know um, when we hear questions about what about XYZ technology. That's super useful feedback from us to know about what to research next or what we should be paying attention to. So I want to break the fourth wall here and, and um, ask of those of you who are attending today to, to let us know what you most want to be building your digital fluency and what you see the lowest common denominator is in your organization or your town or your environment, because we want to help connect the dots. Thank you again. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast. 
platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.